Today we'll be talking about Felix Manz, a 16th century idealist and key figure in the tradition of Christian nonviolence, whose insights in the, into the connection between nonviolence and economic justice still resonate today. And then we'll talk with Rachel Pye Jones about her new book, Pillars. And that tells the story of how her evangelical Christian faith was unraveled and rewoven when she and her husband moved to Somaliland in the Horn of Africa. I'm Susanna Black, Senior Editor at Plow. And I'm Peter Momsen, Editor of the Plow Quarterly. And this is The Plowcast. This is the fifth episode in a six-part series on nonviolence, the violence of love, our most recent issue. And if you haven't yet, make sure to give us a follow on your podcast platform of choice. And while you're at it, subscribe to Plow. Go to plow.com slash subscribe. And now to the conversation. So our first topic today is the Radical Reformation, the tradition of Christian nonviolence, and particularly one key figure in the Radical Reformation, uh, Felix Mance in the city of Zurich. Susanna, in our new issue, you wrote a biographical portrait of him, which is part of our Forerunners series. Uh, Did you ever hear of Felix Mance before uh, you started writing this piece? What's fascinating in all of these like early Reformation history um, stories is finding out just the incredible web of connections between people. We think of that time as being um, kind of deeply unnetworked in a way. Everyone is just in their little village doing whatever kind of vaguely agricultural thing we we think of them doing. But these were people who got around and um, they're personal relationships and the personal conversations that they had in particular places and at particular times, as well as, of course, the, um, the things that they wrote and published and, um, and, and distributed to each other. Um, those particular and really like contingent, um, communications were what started the Reformation, um, and what sent it off in a very, like a variety of different directions. And I find that completely fascinating. The thing that Felix Manson and his friends uh, explored, which in some ways you could say they kind of ended up winning the Reformation. Um, That's a kind of provocative way of saying it, although he was killed at age 29, uh, because the principles they stood for, freedom of conscience, lack no, uh, no coercion in matters of religion, uh, re- economic justice and the importance of communities and expression of Christian love and, uh, in fact, nonviolence um, are principles that the churches of the Reformation and also the Catholic Church ha- have come in largely to adopt in a way that was absolutely unimaginable at the time that they were living. So uh, these three things, freedom of conscience, nonviolence, and community, are really what he stood for, what he was a pioneer of, uh, and what he kind of, and his friends, because it was a network, it wasn't any single one of them, uh, kind of brought brought into the world again, uh, based on their reading of the gospel. Now, of course, this wasn't just a theological debate, right? There was a lot of uh, economic and political forces that kind of brought this confrontation between the Magisterial Reformation and the Radical Reformation to the fore. Um, I, I want to, I really want to get into that a bit, but I'll first say my um, first encounter with Felix Mance was as a really little kid. So growing up in, in the Bruderhof and going to school, he was one of the first people I learned about. And uh, the first martyrs I, I, I learned about Actually, if you visit the city of Zurich today, it's Zurich's built along the Limmat River in which he was drowned. Uh, there's a plaque right along the bank of the river, which I visited a bunch of years ago, uh, marking the spot where he was you know, taken from this boat and thrust under the water with the whole city watching. Um, Swingley d- did approve the execution and, in fact, defended it vociferously to other major figures in the Reformation at the time. Uh, it was one of the first times that a reformer had executed a fellow reformer. Uh, that was 1527. And uh, the spot is, w- what always stood out for me as a little kid is uh, from the account of the execution, uh, Mance's mother is standing along the bank um, shouting to her son to hold fast and not give in up to the last moment till he's kind of, uh, 
uses the words of the martyr Stephen, um, into thy hands I commit my spirit, and is then um, put under the water. Um, and so you imagine this this mom standing at the bank right there by the plaque um, was was always something that kind of stayed with me and I uh, think of with Felix Mance. So then discovering his writings, discovering more about what he was like, I had a chance to go to Zurich a few years ago and came back just uh, a bit of a Mance uh, fan. Yeah, I wanted to know everything about him. And like you said at the beginning, Susanna, this was a very networked world. So this is uh, Zurich, trading city, around 1519, as you said, uh, a new priest, Zwingli, comes. Uh, the Reformation is just sort of starting up in Wittenberg, but it's not really clear, you know, how, how everything is going to align. And he starts just preaching from the gospel every Sunday, and he gathers with him this kind of sodality of young men who are all sort of humanists, and they're inspired by Erasmus. Uh, and they're reading Greek and Latin. They're not just reading the Bible either. They're, they're reading Homer, right? They're reading Plato, and they're reading the, uh, the New Testament, and they're studying Hebrew, and they're getting together at Swingley's house in the evenings and debating this stuff, um, and they're being served by Swingley's uh, girlfriend, um, who he eventually marries, like, after about six years, and she has a kid. Um, Mance himself is the illegitimate son of a priest. His mother oh, I didn't lives know that part. Um, two blocks away from the major city church, the Gr Great Minster in Zurich. Um, and apparently there was a kind of, it was, it was fairly well accepted at that time in Europe for the priests to have mistresses, and she was literally two blocks from the church, and uh, there were other women there in a similar situation. So he, he must have grown up in a, this very ambiguous relationship to the church. Um, he, there's records of him then getting a scholarship to the University of Paris, which presumably, although we ver know very little about that, um, is where he got his Latin and his Greek and uh, was introduced to these circles. Um, and you get a sense, and this is, you know, the Hollywood version of the story would be Mance finally founding, finding the father he never yeah. had in Zwingli, right? Um, and it's almost Zwingli, inevitable the to think older of it man that way. who himself was changing throughout this whole time, um, befriending him and being his mentor, and then Mance and his friends feeling that Zwingli was compromising with political power and that they were not prepared to compromise the gospel for the sake of political power, right? Um, from Swingley's point of view, these are the young hotheads who are imperiling the revolution by pushing things too far too fast. Mm. And they don't recognize the balance in power in the city. They don't recognize the balance in power vis-a-vis -vis the other Swiss cantons and, and, and Rome. Um, they don't recognize the fact that uh, Swiss reformers, when they're being caught in other Swiss cities, there's cases of them being burned at the stake as heretics because mm -hmm. of who has influence where. Um, and into that comes two major, major uh, debates, which impact the sort of wider mm -hmm. theme of, of nonviolence that we're talking about. And one is the mercenary system and the fact that Swiss young men are being used as mercenaries by the princes, including by ecclesiastical princes, including the Pope, um, in their wars because it's an impoverished area and one of the few things they have to export is their young men as mercenaries. Um, so there's this kind of nationalist element to this that we're not going to send our young men to be cannon fodder for other people anymore. Um, Which is that, where the Swiss Guards originally came from, right? Exactly. That's that the, is the origin where the Swiss, of the Swiss Guards, guards in Rome, uh, yeah. originally came from. And then... Um, from the countryside, there is a growing protest against feudal abuses and particularly against ecclesiastical tithes. And tithing at that time, especially in that part of uh, Germany and Switzerland, was in every part of your life. So you literally had to tithe uh, each of your crops, and there was death duties due. Um, what the villages rose in protest against was that their tithes were not going to support their local church, their local pastor. 
but they were vanishing into the metropolis, into Zurich, uh, where they supported uh, a number of religious institutions, uh, but also just went into the pockets of uh, people far away. And meanwhile, they'd be shipped either no village priest or really low quality village priests. And so you have a peasant movement that's growing based on uh, complaints about everything from hunting and fishing rights to local control of mm -hmm. who is our priest, converging with a kind of growing aversion to foreign wars. And then you have humanism and Erasmus is, you know, in praise of folly and then a bunch of young guys getting together in this city and, is, and saying, we're discovering the Gospels for the first time. Uh, and what could, it, what could it look like? You know, this, this another world is possible. This, uh, this sort of Occupy Wall Street feeling is in the air. You get the sense. And Swingley's our friend and Swingley's their buddy. But where they divide is actually not originally over the fairly abstruse sounding question of baptism, but really over what is the, the place of the civil authority vis-a-vis -vis the church. And Swingley's position is, because he soon, for a number of reasons, um, was influential and then in full control of the city government, um, the civil authority is rightfully used to bring about reforms for the sake of the gospel, um, which means that we got to cut some deals along the way. Manson and his friends, pretty early on already by 1523, 1524, are saying um, the city fathers have nothing to say about what the gospel is. And the church, in a way, it was a very Catholic argument that the church should have absolute liberty. Uh, and there should be no role for the civil government in determining its teaching or its worship. Um, strangely enough, the father of one of Felix's um, main buddies, Conrad Grable, was a patrician who led the Catholic party in the city council. So there was this uh, ref reformer, radical reformer, and Catholic triangle going on in the yeah. city government that is a microcosm, I think, of some debates that continue to concern us today. One of the fascinating things to me about the conversations that uh, – Mance and Zwingli and all of um, their group of friends were having was that it seems as though they were relitigating some of the controversies that um, Catholics had talked about among themselves uh, a couple of centuries earlier during, for example, the investiture controversy. So the magisterial reformers were a lot more comfortable with the idea of civil governments having uh, some kind of control over the preaching that was going on in churches or some kind of decision-making power as to who the pastors were going to be. And in a weird way, as you said, the Anabaptists took what had been the um, the Catholic position that the church needed to be, um, that the church was essentially, in some way at least, in authority over the civil government and needed to be free um, to determine its own preaching, to... Uh, convey the gospel as it saw fit and to make decisions about who were going to be the, the, the local, um, the individual local pastors. Um, so the fact that it's essentially a conversation that's been, that had been happening for the entirety of, um, Christian history. And it, it popped up once again in Germany at this time. Well, exactly. And they saw themselves in continuity with that, that conversation. Um, Early Anabaptism, partly thanks to Anabaptists themselves, has sometimes been presented as this grassroots um, purist movement that kind of sprung up. But what's fascinating to me about this group of, uh, of, of guys um, in their little swingly sodality, right, where they would meet weekly to, to chew through this stuff, is it's essentially a rooting group, but a rooting group with the biggest questions quite literally on the line. And there must have been just a, such a tremendous charge in reading their Erasmus together or uh, their going through the, new, the Gospel of Matthew, we know they did, together, and just asking 
how do we live this now, right? Um, and it was in that sense then that um, the question of baptism emerged as a big one and was actually the issue over which Mance was finally executed. Uh, they came to believe, and Swingley actually was sympathetic with this position as a theoretical matter, that there was no strong warrant for uh, infant baptism in the New Testament, and that, in actual fact, every recorded New Testament baptism is on confession of faith and after repentance and amendment of life, which they felt was only possible for a, a person uh, who has reached the age of reason. But what's more, uh, there was a huge economic component to the question of baptism because baptism was the way that you were enrolled um, on the church register. It was the basis of taxation. Uh, it was the basis of social control. And mandatory baptism enforced by civil law actually flies in the face of the Catholic Church's own teaching on what uh, infant baptism ought to be. Um, so infant baptism was really being instrumentalized uh, in the service of social control. And that was what partly they were against, the idea that there, are, there could be any coercion in matters of conscience. Um, and, and it was for this reason that then baptism became this kind of rallying point um, where there is the first baptism is really a quite deliberate act of civil disobedience. The Zurich Council says you must baptize all your infants and you may not re-baptize any adults. The radical group says, oh yes, uh, we will believe God, uh, God rather than men, um, Book of Acts. Um, and they gather and just a few days later hold their first baptism. Um, and refuse to have uh, the infants baptized. And so that's where things start. And very soon after that, there's this movement through the, frankly, oppressed rural villages around uh, Zurich that have been um, under the thumb of the metropolis uh, of baptism. And there's this revival atmosphere. Um, there's this small village uh, right outside Zurich, it's actually now in the suburbs of Zurich, um, where the people get together. Uh, they've been resisting their tithing for a number of years already. Uh, there's a baptism. There's public confession of sin. There's this kind of uh, people throw open their uh, warehouses and open their, their treasures and share them amongst each other. There's this kind of radical act of time of sharing, uh, it goes on for, for several weeks until the Zurich authorities come in, haul dozens of them off to prison, um, extract confessions and recantations from most of them. Uh, and yet they actually were, really weren't able to stamp it out. And this, this kind of movement starts sweeping across Switzerland and southern Germany uh, right at the same time as the peasant war is also happening. And yet this particular radical reformation is determinedly nonviolent. Right. Um, at the same time that they're reproving Swingley for his use of government force, they're also writing to Thomas Münzer, who's leading the peasant rebellion um, up n northwards in, in middle Germany, uh, and reproving him for turning to the sword um, on behalf of the peasants. And you can uh, just really interesting um, moment. Yeah, you can just sort of imagine the way that this would go down if it were today's media landscape. It it feels like you you just you can you can picture it. There would be this like attempt to conflate. Um, you know, there was the the attempt to conflate Munster and Mun Munster, John uh, John of Leyden's sort of freakish um, kind of Occupy Wall Street times a thousand. Um, wife swapping situation with a lot of violence um in in Munster um with all reformation and with all with um you know on the part of the catholics with with the magisterial reformation on the part of the magisterial reformers with um all anabaptism so there would have been it just seems like there would have been a kind of deep um sort of attempt to conflate or a difficulty in unconflating these different um, these different sort of movements, even though they were profoundly at odds with each other. 
And of course, Mance wouldn't love to see that some of those confusions, right? He, he was executed in 1527. He spent two years underground. Uh, and then he's finally caught in Zurich again. He's a Zurich citizen. He's repeatedly disobeyed uh, the command to cease from preaching. Um, he does his Acts 519 again, will obey God more than men. And um, it, it is at that point that he is then condemned to death. Uh, first, as I say, the first um, execution in a reformed territory of a religious dissenter. And the form that the execution took was a kind of mocking of the idea of rebaptism, right? He was drowned, which was a kind of, you wanted to be baptized, I'll baptize you. Exactly. And there is an amazing hymn, actually, it's in the Amish hymnal, uh, still today, that he wrote on the night before his execution. Um, I sing with exultation. It's actually, we sing it in our communities, too. Um, and uh, you get a sense of the joy with which he went to his his death. And you get a sense, too, that his mother, who I mentioned before, <laughs> and his uh, his comrades must have provided him with a, a great sense of confidence um, in his last hours. Like I said, if you ever go to Zurich, um, you can visit the spot, and they have a... Uh, an exhibit that's in the city um, about him. I actually spent some time talking with the head of the Reformed Church in Switzerland a couple uh, years ago uh, about Mance in, in particular, uh, because the Reformed Church, you know, kind of feels bad about Mance um, now, and they just had their 500 uh, years of Reformation celebration in, in Zurich, uh, and he was a big part of it. Uh, and it's, uh, he's now kind of looked to as, as, uh, a Zurich hero, uh, mm -hmm. in a really, in a way I found really, really touching, um, that the reformed church kind of commemorates him too, as well now. Yeah, that is amazing. One thing you learned from Mance is what we talked about in an earlier, uh, in an earlier episode of this podcast Christian nonviolence is a soldier's way, and that's how Mance saw it. And there was a tremendous adventure, and there was a tremendous daring. Um, the the early Anabaptists are often called sectarians. In fact, I was just in a conversation with a Catholic book group at Columbia University last night where we were talking about the questions of violence and nonviolence. And the first, the first word out of people's mouth when you talk about gospel nonviolence is sectarian, right? Uh -huh. When you read Mance, there, and there is, there is an idea of the church being a separate society, right? Which is actually just biblical. But he, there is not a sectarian spirit to him in the sense of a narrowness. There, there is that humanist breath. And he, he genuinely, I think, couldn't understand how Swingley didn't get it, that the church was meant to be a free, willing organization and not one supported by state coercion. He, he, to the end of his life, he, he, he seems not to have just, he couldn't understand how Swingley couldn't make that leap. And I think Swingley from his side couldn't get how Mance was, wasn't able to understand the real politic of the situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea of a kind of reading group slash Bible study that slash, you know, <laughs> essentially Christian um, intellectual project that as you're doing it, you're starting to get the sense that we might end up killing each other is really something that the fact that that no longer is um, the way that in, at least in, in generally the way that our disagreements play out and that we do have this sense of persuasion rather than um, rather than coercion in matters of faith does, I think, indicate that, as you say, on some level, Felix Mance won. Let's move to our intermezzo. 
where, as usual, we're going to just catch you up on things happening in the wider plow community. So, Susanna, I think you have some good news. Spring is coming. Spring is coming. I My, uh, my sort of, like, um, job here is to just kind of describe what's going on with the downstate slash New York City plow gang, um, which of which there are uh, many. And basically what I did this past Saturday was I went into Central Park and I lolled around on the grass with like 20 different friends. Um, and we were, you know, masking and socially distancing to a large degree. Um, but a whole bunch of them had already been, um, or at least some of them had already been at least partially vaccinated. And I, you know, did my own DIY vaccine in the sense that I got over COVID. Um, and it was just this kind of like sense of, it was so, it was so gorgeous. It was so warm. Um, we were drinking homemade blackberry shrub. Um, and it was just this sense of like, all right, I think we're getting through this. I think we're going to get through this. And, um, one of the things that it's, it made me think about and that I have been thinking about was, um, you know, we spent the last year kind of being cautious about each other physically and being and learning how to not socialize in person. And I think what's going to be really important for us to do over the, ne the next couple of months after, you know, it becomes safe is to just kind of like push back against the instincts that we've needed to develop and remember that we're not actually dangerous to each other <laughs> and that it is in fact important to just hang out with your friends in Central Park and drink blackberry shrub. Yeah, I think that's that's crucial. And I, I know for myself, you almost have to make a conscious decision uh, that I, I can do this, right? I can meet with a big group of people because you can now with the weather so nice. You, you actually can quite safely meet with quite a few people and you kind of have to learn to enjoy it again. The uh, thing that we're doing here and this podcast is going to air a couple of weeks from now, but it is, we're recording this right the two weeks before Easter and those two weeks before Easter and the Brudoff community where I live, it's just really important. We actually largely start shutting down um, our work and turn more and more um, to preparing for the Holy Week and then uh, for Good Friday and Easter itself. And we kind of have a bunch of things to help us do that. And one that my kids are really excited about is they spend um, this week and the next preparing a series of gardens um, near our community cemetery. Uh, and those will be the seven stations of the cross. And uh, they'll plant flowers, make little crosses, um, and kind of put by each one a part of, you know, those seven stations of the cross, maybe a story or a reminder or some little sign of what that station is. And then in the days of Holy Thursday and Good Friday, um, we'll be going there, you know, and individually or as families and just spending time in each of those little gardens and thinking of, of Jesus and what happened. So really looking for that and really glad it's not raining while we're trying to do that. So joining us today from Djibouti is Rachel Pye Jones, uh, whose new book, Pillars, is out from Plow. The subtitle is How Muslim Friends Led Me Closer to Jesus. And Rachel's also contributed uh, an excerpt from that to our current issue uh, about what she's learned from the five pillars of Islam and how her friendships with Somali Muslims in the Horn of Africa um, kind of helped her rediscover, reweave, rethink her American evangelical Christianity. So welcome, Rachel. So glad to have you here. Thanks. It's really good to be here. Could you start by just telling us what brought you to the Horn of Africa and what's sort of the story that led up to this book? So when my husband and I were first married, we lived in a high-rise apartment complex in downtown Minneapolis that was at that time mostly full of refugees from Somalia. So our neighbors immediately were Somalis. And we were planning to move abroad. My husband wanted to teach internationally. And so our neighbors told us about this university in Somalia and said we, could, we should go teach there. And we thought, 
no way. Somalia is, all we knew at that time was danger. You know, we were afraid of Somalia. We were, we just had no concept for how to live there. And so they explained to us that this university up in the north was in a peaceful location and that as they were inviting us to come there, they would help us to adjust and to, you know, be safe and develop community. And so we decided to take that huge leap from Minneapolis to a rural village in Somalia in 2003. And we had two year old twins at the time. And my husband started teaching at the university there. And it was exactly as transformative and um, challenging as you might imagine. Everything was different from obviously the language, but the clothing the religion, um, how to cook, how to walk, even everything was rocky and thorny. And it just required a lot of humility and um, dependence on the people around me, which right from the beginning made a huge impact on me. And while, while you were there, uh, you kind of ran across the woman who was the subject of your first book, Stronger Than Death on Annalena Tonelli. Um, and she or her example kind of helped you think about what it means to be a, a Christian missionary, right? Well, you know, actually, I never actually met her in person. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband did one time. And I heard about her that this woman was living in the village that she was working with tuberculosis patients that she had developed this really incredible hospital, but I never met her. She was too busy. She was too devoted to the people who needed her to spend time with other foreigners. And so I actually didn't discover much of her story until much later when I started writing her story. She was assassinated in 2003 in October. And at that point, Another British couple was also murdered. And so my family was forced to flee from that village and kind of abandon our first start in Africa. And I remember thinking about her, like why had she been here for so long? And everybody said they loved her um, and really appreciated her presence. And then somebody killed her, but I didn't have much time to really wrestle with that until much later. But yes, her example, as I studied it and thought about it over the, the later years, really forced me to examine what does it mean to live as a Christian in a Muslim country? And, you know, I don't really identify, I don't really like the word missionary. It's got a lot of baggage culturally and historically. And so we kind of set that word aside, but we definitely are Christians. I come from a Baptist background. I am Baptist evangelical. And so what does it look like? Or what does it mean to really live an authentic Christian faith, the way that Annalena had done as a Catholic among Muslims, um, how do we practice our faith? What can I learn from them? What could they learn from me? How can this be a, a real authentic two-way kind of relationship where both of us, both Muslim and Christian, are discovering new and fresh things about God and new ways to embody faith or practice faith? And so, um, so yeah, I would say I learned a lot from studying her example, but even more so from, from my Somali community and how they practice faith. Um, so she kind of modeled living as a Christian well among Muslims, and then Muslims modeled for me new ways to think about faith that I hadn't really considered. You know, Islam, at least the way that I've encountered it, is very embodied. And so my, my Baptist tradition is, um, it's kind of, it's very spiritual, but it's not very earthy. So, you know, Muslims are bowing in prayer five times a day with their body. They're kneeling on the ground. They're putting their forehead to the earth. If they pray five times a day consistently over the course of their life, they will end up with a bruise in the center of their forehead. I kind of, I think of it as a tattoo of devotion. Um, they fast for 30 days as a global community. They go on the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. More than a million people, sometimes two million people are in one location doing very physical activities to represent their faith. And I didn't really have much of that in my, my faith upbringing, my religious upbringing experience. And it was really interesting for me to think about as a Christian, what are the traditions that I maybe missed, missed um, in my Baptist tradition that are part of the global and historical practice of Christianity? And also what can I learn from these Islamic forms that, that would provide meaning to me personally? 
And so a lot of that, I've just been watching and asking a lot of questions of my community as I've explored those things. You get into that in your, uh, the excerpt that ran in Plow, one of the five pillars of Islam is, is prayer. And what struck up to me is this uh, great story you tell of a fundamental uh, misunderstanding between you and, and your Muslim neighbor about what prayer uh, is. Uh, would you mind telling that story? This was in Somaliland, so I had only been there, you know, a few months. I'm really devoted to learning language, so I had been trying really hard to learn Somali. And so we were out in the, the street between our houses in the afternoon. Our kids were kind of playing among the cactuses and the goats and things. And she asked me if I prayed. And I knew she had asked me if I prayed. And so I said, yeah, I pray all day, thinking like as a Christian, I'm, I'm just in the presence of God. I'm living in the presence of the spirit and I'm filled with the spirit. I'm, I'm praying all day. And I'm thinking I'm giving her a real spiritual answer. I'm really explaining something about Christianity here. And I was feeling a little bit, I'm a little bit proud, you know, even that I'd had a conversation in Somali, one of the first sort of back and forth a little bit, you know, very, very stuntedly, but um, and then she just stared at me like, what are you talking about? You can't pray all day. That doesn't make any sense. And it also, it's not honest. From then I realized in, in retrospect, the word that she had used for prayer was salat. And salat is the five structured prayer times, the, the actual emotions, the washing they do ahead of time, and these the ritualized prayer. And so there is no possible way that I'm praying all day long. You know, I'm clearly going to the market. I'm clearly taking care of my kids. I'm not praying all day. And then I later learned there's another word in Somali for prayer, which is dua, which is more of the kind of prayer I was thinking, like spontaneous, making requests, um, presenting things to God and, and engaging in that way. And that was a different word. And so it really made me, and later once I understood these differences, look back and think, my answer to her was from my own understanding of the language, but also worldview and my own faith system. And in order to have a real conversation, I would need to understand what was behind her question. What is she asking? What are the words meaning? What is she bringing to that conversation that could inform our exchange that would make it more fruitful for both of us? And I think that lesson has been really helpful for me because it's it's just showing me that I have to try to understand their perspective, their worldview, in order to have anything make sense that I say or to have any impact or to, to really appreciate each other. I have to be willing to understand where they're coming from. And so, so yeah, that was just a really interesting lesson for me, um, kind of humbling in retrospect, um, but also really valuable. Can you think of another example of um, just sort of a moment when you realized that your assumptions or your worldview were were not shared? Sure. Um, this is in Djibouti after we had to evacuate and then came across the border here. At one point, I felt led to do an extended fast. And so the fast that I was engaging in was coming from how I had been taught and encouraged and modeled as Christian in the U.S. to fast, um, no food only water for, you know, a number of days. And um, I was, again, I was struggling with a little bit of pride about this at the same time as really wanting to do it. But pride is something that the Lord is constantly trying to strip away from me. And um, my, the, the housekeeper in my house, a good friend, she was really upset with me that I was fasting in this way. And she could only imagine that my fast was a sin, not only not valuable, but actually sinful because I wasn't doing it in the way that she understood fasting, which to her was in the morning, even whether it's during Ramadan or a spontaneous fast that a Muslim wants to engage in on their own, they will eat in the morning before sunrise and then they will not drink any water or any food until sunset. And then at sunset they'll have, especially during Ramadan, they'll have a big feast with everybody. And then the next day they'll do it again. And part of the value of that feast is to remind them of the celebration, to um, to remind them even of hunger, just to celebrate that they have fasted and now they're thankful and then they're going to engage the next day in fasting again. And so the fact that I wasn't breaking the fast at night and that I was also drinking water during the day 
these two things completely nullified my fast to the point of making it potentially a sin. An anti-fast. Yeah, yeah, an anti-fast. Um, that was pretty uh, mind-blowing. I don't know if that's the right word, but spiritually um, complicated for me to get my mind around. But once I did, once I understood why she was so concerned for me, and so once I understood that, then I was a little bit, again, better able to explain why I was fasting that way, what I was getting out of it. Um, and also then in the future, when I did decide to fast again, sometimes I do it in a similar pattern to how they would. Sometimes I don't, but it just, again, exposed me to different ways of engaging in spiritual practice. And it, it was interesting to think about how we both held so strongly to our, our cultural practice of it. Um, you know, here, even to the point that you should break the fast with specific foods. And so, which in different Muslim countries, it might be a different food, but, but those things come very loaded and laden with religious meaning for people. Can you describe the conversation that you've had? Um, like, have you had the kinds of conversations with Muslims um, that kind of lead you to sort of see commonalities in your, in your, the, the way that you and, and they relate to God? You know, there's so many things that we do have in common, including the prophets. And so I remember again with this, the same friend that was concerned about my fast, um, we had ordered a container of supplies to come from Dubai with a car and some furniture because we didn't have anything. So we were, we had moved to Djibouti with a couple of bags. I think we had a mattress. We got our kids a bed. And that was about it. And so I was anxiously waiting this container to arrive and I'm starting to get pretty impatient. And she knew that I was getting impatient. Um, and she sat me down one, one day and she said, you know what, you need to be like Job. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> um, she said, and then she told me the Islamic story of Job. And she said that he would, he was so patient with his suffering that he had these boils on his body and there were maggots crawling in the boils and he would pick out the maggots and gently set them on the ground instead of you know, killing them or squishing them. And he was just so patient with his suffering. And so she was challenging me um, and I thought, oh, that's a, she's right. I can be patient. I mean, my suffering is nothing compared to Job's suffering, right? But, but just that we were able even in that moment to share a little bit of understanding of this this prophet. And, um, and that led into other conversations of, oh, do you know about this prophet? And I told her the story of Joseph from the Bible and the Joseph has a long chapter in the Quran. Um, and so that was also just a really fun conversation to have. And it was an ongoing conversation that we re returned to multiple times of, um, tell me again, that story from the Bible about Joseph, tell me again about when he forgave his brothers or, you know, all those, it's such a great story. So so finding those common grounds of characters that we share and characters, not the right word, but prophets mm -hmm. from our, um, our religious history has been really fun. Why did you pick the uh, five pillars of Islam as the kind of pillars to build your book around? And, uh, you know, uh, of course, from coming from a Protestant perspective, the pillar, the the Islamic pillars are are kind of works, not faith, right? And uh, we have this sort of suspicion of any kind of ritualized uh, piety uh, that that will somehow earn us points with God, right? So, what did you learn about that, and how did you kind of deal with that nagging uh, Protestant voice in the back of your head? I didn't want to make this a book of explaining Islam. I don't feel like that's my role or responsibility to explain this to Christians. But I felt like it would still provide some ways that they could learn about some of the foundational things about Islam without making it a dogmatic kind of book. Um, and also because those are really the things that structure my engagement with Muslims, I suppose, because the call to prayer is so constant, because I'm urged to say the Shahada, which is their creed, um, on a regular basis. Um, I think that just felt like a natural way to to show the things that I've been learning while also highlighting the things that are important to my Muslim friends. Um, and one that was the most interesting for me to wrestle with in writing was the Hajj, the pilgrimage, because it's the most mysterious in the sense of you can't go on it unless you're a Muslim. And so it's, it's fairly exclusive, although millions of people go on it because there are 
you know, a billion Muslims in the world, but to a Christian, we're definitely outside that. I don't share that same thing where the entire Christian body globally goes on the same event, you know, the same um, tour or whatever. And so that one was really more challenging to think about, but I really enjoyed it. Reading, um, hearing from people who have been on it, studying the activities of it. Um, but then also at the same time, there is the sense exactly like you said of this, these are works and they're done to, to gain points, to earn God's approval, to earn God's mercy, which is never a guarantee. So even there's, um, I, th I can't remember the exact quote, it's in the book, but there is this idea that you can go on Hajj and do all of it correctly and finish it and still not be rewarded for it because you don't know for sure that you've earned God's mercy. It's kind of um, capricious. Like it, he could have mercy on you or not. Maybe you don't go on Hajj and you still will earn the mercy. And so there's a real lack of, um, of uh, certainty. Mm. Whereas I, I feel more of that certainty. Like I know that I'm resting in grace because of Jesus. And so that is something I wrestled with. And I didn't want to embrace these things legalistically. So, um, you know, I've had people ask me to become a Muslim. But one of the reasons I say I don't want to is because I am so thankful for grace. I could never earn the grace that I've been given. You know, I can't. I know that I won't be able to pray five times a day and fast every time perfectly during Ramadan. And so, um, you know, that's something that we do talk about also in, in relationship of just why, why I don't want that legalism. I can be prone to legalism already in my Christian faith and, you know, judgment of myself or of others, of course. And, and so I don't want to, um, I don't want to have any more opportunity to, <laughs> foster that side of my sinful heart and so I, I just lean on grace and so yeah that is something that I've really thought about and it's also exposed some of the ways that I think that um and so the the pillar of zakat which is charity or giving really exposed in my own heart this idea that I could earn something from God and so my friends would say um you know when you're giving to that person or if you're going to give somebody to a beggar give it to me and I'll hand it to them. And so all of us will get extra blessing. I, me, Rachel would get the blessing for having given the money. My friend would get the money for deliver or the, the blessing for delivering the money. And the beggar would get the blessing for giving us the opportunity to give to them. And so, and it was very clearly that we were giving and engaging in this in order to earn grace or uh, not grace, um, God's pleasure or good points. And at first I was like, that is, that makes me really uncomfortable to be so blatant about the seeking after of rewards. But then I realized like I was pregnant here and I really had this idea that because I have decided to move my family here, because I'm trusting God for life here, he's guaranteed, he's got to give me a healthy baby. It's like, a, I've earned it, you know? And so I all of a sudden had to really wrestle with the ways that I was expecting a reward or a goodness or a mercy on my family because I had done something else. So, so I don't want that legalism, but I'm prone to it, you know? Wow. That's a, that's a powerful example. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Rachel. And uh, we're so excited from plow now to, to be publishing your book and uh, it has so many beautiful, memorable stories in it uh, that can not recommend it highly enough. So, Thank you, and all the best there in Djibouti for you and your family. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So this is the point in the podcast when we talk about our recommendations. Um, and my recommendation for this week is a new set of essays, um, which are hosted on um, Dibir Marusik and Shadi Hamid's blog slash kind of media empire uh, the Wisdom of Crowds. So it's wisdomofcrowds.live. And it's a series of essays called the Democracy Essays, which are um, kind of organized and a lot of them are written by um, Sam Kimbriel, Samuel Kimbriel, and Osita Nwanevu, whose name I might, might be mispronouncing. Um, Sam is a philosopher. Osita is a journalist. 
And they are attempting, to, they're starting out this project that kind of apparently grew out of a reading group that they've got going in DC um, to just look at the foundations of um, political order. And they're organizing this around the question of what is democracy? Is it as good as we think it is? What uh, what are the assumptions that we're making when we um, when we talk about democracy? So that is, you can Google just democracy essays and wisdom of crowds or um, democracy essays and Kimbriel, it's, that'll probably get you there. So K-I-M-B-R-I-E-L. And I just cannot recommend this project enough. It's fascinating and kind of asking the questions that um, it generally does not occur to us to ask. My recommendation is actually uh, the Gospels. In this case, though, a new translation of the Gospels by the literary translator Sarah Rudin. Uh, Sarah has been a contributor to Plow, and Modern Library commissioned a new translation of the Gospels as part of their sort of Modern Library series. So this is a literary translation of the four Gospels. Sarah is known for her translations of uh, Greek plays, uh, she's done the Greek tragedies, Aristophanes. She has a beautiful translation of the Aeneid that I'm reading with my daughter right now. Uh, we just paused for uh, Lent, but we're going to get back to it after Easter. Here comes the Gospels from her. And it's, you know, there's so many fresh readings and renderings in this that I'm just greatly enjoying it. There's a, a, a real literary translator's sense. And one thing she brings out most and I can't get into a lot of the details here, um, is the humor in the Gospels that you might not have suspected was is there. So uh, check it out. Sarah Rudin's The Gospels from Modern Library uh, just got published this month, March. That's all for this episode of The Plowcast. We'll be back here again next week. Mm -hmm.